Section 1. You will hear a new student, Tom, talking to a student representative called Rachel about university clubs. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Hi, welcome to Freshers Week. I'm Rachel. Can I help you? Oh, hi. Yes, um, I was hoping to find out about some clubs I could join. Well, all the club stands are here in this hall. What were you interested in? Um, not sure. <laughs> I wanted to do something where I could meet people. Well, take this leaflet with details of all the clubs and see what you think. Oh. It'll probably depend on what day you're free. Like on Mondays, there's the film club. Then on Tuesdays, you've got the climbing club. That's really good. I'm in that. <laughs> <laughs> then on Wednesdays, you've got chess, if you want something a bit more intellectual. But you should look through carefully, because all the clubs run extra activities as well as their normal meetings. Oh, yes, I see. So, it looks like the film club has discussions after the films. I'd quite like to go to those. Then, climbing. <laughs> Goodness. It says here that the university has its own climbing wall. That's impressive. And they go on weekend trips. Mm. Cool. And it says the chess club normally just does games with whoever turns up. But it also runs competitions sometimes but I bet you've got to be pretty good to do that. Yes, I think so. And how many people are in the clubs? Are they all really full? Well, obviously they're all different. So, for example, the film club has just increased its membership from 85 to 125, but I think they're hoping to extend it to 150. The climbing club's quite small, 40 people. And the chess club is fairly healthy at 55. Right. OK. So who do I see if I want to join these clubs? Well, if you go round the stands and speak to the people there. For the film club, that's the events organiser. Um, for climbing, you'll need the club secretary. And the chess club is organised by one of the maths tutors. OK? Yep. <laughs> I think I'll start with the climbing club. It sounds good. Oh, well, as I said, I'm in that, so I might be able to help you a bit. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. OK. It says in the leaflet that they get together twice a month. Is that right? Yes. Oh, you must join. It's really good fun. <laughs> we go away quite a bit to North Wales, and every year we have a special excursion, usually to France, which is where we're going this year in the spring. The weather's too unpredictable in the autumn. Wow. That sounds good. But it must cost a lot. Yeah, but we try and save up for it through subscriptions. So rather than having a huge sum to pay in the month we go, we collect those weekly, so it spreads it out. Good idea. I think I'll definitely join. There are quite good benefits you get from joining. I mean, you need that, don't you? And the university clubs normally try and do deals with local businesses. So it's really worth joining. Like in the climbing club, they've got a special arrangement with one of the shops in town. So if you show your card, you can get money off equipment. Don't think the discount extends to clothes, though. That's really worth it, then.
I'll go over and talk to them now. OK. Hope you do join. <laughs> oh, and another thing I meant to say. If you do become a member, you automatically receive a magazine once a year. It's quite useful and interesting because it goes out to all the national climbing clubs. And the other thing is, if you come to every session, then you can get a complimentary ticket to the big exhibition that's held in Cardiff every year. So, hope to see you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for your help. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You'll hear a tour guide talking to a group of visitors about Bestley Castle. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Bestley Castle. It's nice to see so many of you here today. Before we go in, I'd like to tell you some information about the castle, the things to see and do, and the facilities available to you in the grounds. We'll do our best to make this a truly memorable visit. Now, the castle grounds are quite big, and we don't want you to get lost, so I'm going to give you an idea of the layout. At the moment, we are at the entrance, and immediately to our left is the tourist information office. Go here if you need any questions answered. They'll be happy to help. And of course, behind the tourist office is the car park where the coach dropped you off and it'll also pick you up from the same spot at 5 p.m. today. In front of us are the water gardens. If you stroll through, you get to the North Bridge, which is the entrance to Besley Castle. Take your time and enjoy looking around the castle. There's a lot of history steeped in those walls. As you leave the castle via the South Bridge, you'll be greeted with the sight of roaming deer. During the day, there will be scheduled feeding opportunities where visitors can get involved. However, we do request that you do not feed the deer outside these times. To the right of the deer park is the Castle Museum, and behind that is our award-winning restaurant. It's a relatively new addition to the castle grounds, but is fast gaining a reputation for its food. Alternatively, you can choose to dine in the picnic area on the other side of the deer park. It's perfect for the family as it's next to the kids' play area and homemade ice cream hut. We hope that on your way out, you pop into the gift shop by the exit for something to remember us by. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Admission to the grounds is free for all. That includes the museum, gardens and picnic area. There is an admission fee for the castle, which is £6.50 for adults, with a 10% discount for students and retired people. Children under the age of 16 pay half adult price and under 8 go in free. There are many spectacular events throughout the year, and for most of them, there's also an admission fee. As these events are in high demand, it's a good idea to book well in advance. Some of the exciting events planned for this year are the Summer Medieval Festival, 
where you can watch old-fashioned nights and experience a feast in the halls of the castle as if you were a guest of King Henry VIII himself. There are several concerts planned this year too, including a rock concert at an admission price of £10 per person and a special jazz concert which is free to the public. I'm sure you'll agree that all tastes and ages will be satisfied. One scary but extremely popular event is the annual Haunted Castle event at the end of October, where the castle comes alive at night. Why don't you come along if you're brave enough? Another sight to see is the fantastic firework display on November 5th, and the cost of that includes refreshments. We also have a long tradition of raising money for charity. The charity event held every year on the first day of May will this year be an archery contest. Entrance is free, but donations are certainly welcome. This year, we'll be collecting money on behalf of a charity for elderly people, age concern. Just in case you can't remember all of that, you can pick up a leaflet showing the timetable and prices for all events from the Tourist Information Desk. You can also go online to get this information from our website. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You'll hear a conversation in a university student services office. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, um, I'm Dawn Matthews. Yes, hello. I've been referred to you because I'm inquiring about the refresher courses that you run. I'd like to find out a bit more about them. OK. Well, we run quite a few different short courses for students who are either returning to study or studying part-time. Um... Tell me about your situation. Well, I think that I really need some help in preparing for the coming semester, uh, especially to build up my confidence a bit and um, help me study effectively because, you see, I've been out in the workforce for nearly 12 years now, so it really is a long time since I was last a student. <laughs> yes, it can seem like a long time, can't <laughs> it? Um, well, let me start by telling you what courses we have that might suit you. Are you an undergraduate or a postgraduate, arts or sciences? Undergraduate, and I'm in the business faculty. Right, then. Well, first of all, there's our intensive Study for Success seminar on the 1st and 2nd of February. Mm -hmm. It's aimed at students like you who are uncertain about what to expect at college and looks at a fairly wide range of approaches to university learning mm. to motivate you to begin your study and build on your own learning strategies. Mm, that sounds good. Uh, what are some of the strategies that are presented? Well, we try to cover all aspects of study. Some of the strategies in writing, for example, would be improving your planning for writing, organising your thinking and building some techniques to help you write more clearly. With reading, there'll be sessions aimed at getting into the habit of analysing material as you read it mm. and tips to help you record and remember what you've read. It really is very important to begin reading confidently right from the beginning. Mm. There's also advice on how to get the most from your lectures and practice in giving confident presentations, as well as how to prepare for exams. What about the motivational side of things? Ah, well, there's a range of motivational exercises that we do 
to help the students feel positive and enthusiastic about their study. The process of learning and exploring a subject can lead to a whole new way of looking at the world, and the study skills and techniques that you build up can be applied in all sorts of different ways. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, actually, I, um, mm? I'm very excited about the whole thing of taking up studying again, mm. but, you know, I, I'm a little nervous about whether I'll manage to get everything done. Uh, I suppose it's the same for all mature students. Of course it is. <laughs> Two of the key components of the course are time management and overcoming procrastination. People discover that once they learn to plan their days, all the work can be accomplished and there'll still be time for leisure. Is there an enrolment fee? Well, um, oh, just a minute, let's see. Ah, uh, the cost is £30, which includes all course materials and morning tea. You have to arrange your own lunch. Mm, well, that wouldn't be a problem. Uh, I already make sandwiches for my three kids and my wife and myself every day. Uh, I won't have to change my routine. No. <laughs> Now, I need to tell you that this is a very popular course and it's essential that you book well ahead of time. In fact, the course convener tells me that there are only five places left. Um, what other course might be good for me? There is one other that you could benefit from. It's simply called Learning Skills for University Study and is on three consecutive mornings starting on a Monday from 9 to 12 and costs £25. Hmm. This is aimed at upgrading the study skills most school leavers have and help them cope with the increased demands of university study. It focuses mainly on making students more responsible for their own success. What sort of things are covered in this course? Well, basically, it's more advanced thinking, note-taking, reading and writing strategies but also some input about stress management. Hmm. I think I'd be better off starting from the basics and looking at all the strategies, don't you? Yes. From what you've told me, I think that's more in line with your situation. All right, then. Um, can I book a place on the Study for Success seminar course now? Yes. Let me just get out a registration form and take down your details. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a further education marine biology lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning everyone and welcome to this further education lecture on marine biology. Today we're going to look at the coelacanth. The discovery of the coelacanth has been compared to finding a dinosaur walking around today over 85 million years after it went extinct. The story began a few days before Christmas in 1938, when the first living coelacanth was discovered off the east coast of South Africa, at the mouth of the Chalumna River. The fish was caught in a shark gill net by Captain Goosen and his crew, who, recognising the bizarre nature of their catch, alerted the local museum in the small South African town of East London. The director of the East London Museum at the time was Miss Marjorie Courtney Latimer, after whom the coelacanth was eventually named. 
Miss Courtney Latimer offered bounties to fishermen for unfamiliar fish. It was Miss Courtney Latimer who alerted the prominent South African ichthyologist, Dr. J. L. B. Smith, who initially identified the fish, and subsequently informed the world about this amazing discovery. This first coelacanth led to the discovery of the first documented population off the remote Comoros Islands between the mainland of Africa and Madagascar. For 60 years, this was presumed to be the only coelacanth population in existence. Originally, it was a concern that the coelacanth might have a very limited range and that overfishing along the Comoros Islands might wipe it out. However, Scientists were amazed when, on July the 30th, 1998, an American scientist discovered a coelacanth population in Indonesia. Dr. Mark Erdman was on a honeymoon trip to the area investigating a coral reef research site when he spotted a strange fish being wheeled into the fish market. He recognized the fish as a coelacanth and snapped a picture before it was sold. Dr. Erdman's subsequent research revealed that the people from Sulawesi had a name for it, Raja, King of the Sea. The Sulawesi coelacanth colony is about 10,000 kilometers east of where the coelacanths were previously known to occur in the Western Indian Ocean. Both Sulawesi and Comoros coelacanths are quite different from all other living fish, but perhaps the most interesting feature of the coelacanth is that it has paired lobed fins, which move in a similar fashion to our arms and legs. Coelacanths also have an extra lobe on their tail and a vertebral column that is not fully developed. They are the only living animal to have a fully functional intracranial joint, a division that separates the ear and brain from the nasal organs and eye, and allows the front part of the head to be lifted when the fish is feeding. The brown Sulawesi coelacanth and the steel blue Comoros coelacanth share these unusual characteristics. The discovery of the coelacanth in 1938 is still considered to be the zoological find of the century. This living fossil comes from a lineage of fish that was thought to have been extinct since the time of the dinosaurs. Coelacanths are known from the fossil record dating back over 360 million years and peaked in abundance about 240 million years ago. Before 1938, they were believed to have become extinct approximately 80 million years ago, after mysteriously disappearing from the fossil record. How could the coelacanth disappear for over 80 million years, and then turn up alive and well in the 20th century? The answer seems to be, that fossil coelacanths appeared to live in environments with clay sedimentation with plenty of volcanic activity. Modern coelacanths, both in the Comoros and Sulawesi, inhabit caves and overhangs in vertical marine reefs at about 200 metres, environments not conducive to fossil creation. In 1991, scientists got a better understanding of the fish when the Comoros got their independence from France, and French restrictions on research were lifted. This allowed scientists to study the fish off the Comoros Islands. As the animal hides in underwater caves some 300 to 700 feet down during the day, and comes out at night to feed, diving is not an option, and previously only fishermen specimens had been available for study. But this time, the scientists had their own submarine, so they could study the coelacanth in its natural habitat through portholes. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.